massed ranks of row after row of well-equipped soldiers ready to do your bidding, an endless procession of supplicants bearing tribute and groveling beneath your throne, blood-drenched heaps of the brutally dismembered bodies of your enemies. These are just a few of the images that ancient rulers chose to have memorialized in art, and which served as not very subtle statements of propaganda extolling their might. Across almost every ancient society, those in power had a predilection for using art and architecture to promote their rule and to publicly illustrate their domination over rivals, uh, both internal and external. While this sort of grandstanding might seem arrogant or even distasteful to us, it did produce some of the most impressive and sometimes even beautiful monuments of the ancient world. In this lecture, I want to examine several of these monuments from very different cultures around the globe, but that all share this common theme of being an expression of power and domination through art and architecture. I'll begin with a rather obvious example that was featured in the palace of the Persian King of Kings at Persepolis. The centerpiece of this complex was a structure known as the Apadana, which seems to have been a kind of combination throne room and royal reception hall. It was a square about 300 feet per side, and the roof was held up by 72 magnificent stone columns. Uh, each of which was almost 75 feet high. And access to the platform on which this room rested was by these sweeping staircases at the sides. And the walls adjacent to those staircases were decorated with finely carved stone reliefs of nearly 3,000 human figures, most of which are several feet high. Those figures really form a grand parade, consisting of groups of the king's subjects, starting with the noblemen, who are resplendent in their finery and are accompanied by all their retainers. It also includes the royal guardsmen, and they're perfectly rendered with all of their weapons very accurately shown. But the core of this parade is representatives from all the different lands that have been conquered by the Persians. And these envoys or ambassadors is each shown in the distinctive costume of his nation. And they bear with them an amazing array of offerings which they've brought to lay before the feet of the Persian king of kings. So some of them bring exotic animals, such as the uh, Susian envoy who leads a lion on a leash, along with two little cubs being carried by his attendants. The Ionians from uh, one of the Greek regions hold beehives of sweet honey and finely wrought textiles. The Ethiopians, appropriately enough, carry ivory elephant tusks. And in all, there are 23 separate delegations that are shown bearing tribute and coming to make their obeisance before the King of Kings. The tribute procession of Persepolis was plainly intended to act as a reminder to foreign envoys who have come to speak with the ruler of Persia of the size and the wealth of his domain. It also uh, impresses anyone who looks at it with the aptness of his title of King of Kings, since it overtly shows the representatives of so many different nations offering their submission to him. And the basic message of that relief was that all the world bows down before the Persian king. Because of the quality and detail of these carvings, the monument also happens to be one of the most helpful guides for modern scholars to use in identifying the uh, distinctive clothing and jewelry which was worn by different ancient Near Eastern peoples. But we should never forget that the original purpose of these beautiful artworks was to intimidate and to awe. In South America, about 170 miles from Lima, is an archaeological site known as Cerro Sechin. And it was built by one of the very early civilizations of the Andes. It may be associated with Chavin culture, which I talked about. It also has a carved stone procession. 
And this one is, if possible, even more blatant in its message than the one at Persepolis. The centerpiece of Cerro Sachin is a raised platform with retaining walls. And those walls have set into them a series of what uh, originally would have been about 400 granite slabs. And these are entirely covered with carvings that depict a parade of what seems to be high-ranking individuals, maybe warriors. Uh, they're bearing staffs, some of them have scepters, and all of them have very ornamental headgear. And those figures are carved to look uh, as if they're sort of emerging from the central doorway and then marching around the sides of this structure. The really attention-grabbing aspect of these reliefs, however, is that interspersed among and between these stately figures is a jumbled confusion of corpses, dismembered bodies, and human body parts. And these images are extremely gruesome and graphic. So they include things like decapitated torsos gushing thick streams of blood, uh, bodies with their intestines spilling out of huge holes in the abdomen, and everywhere there's piles of human heads, hands, feet, legs, bones, guts, ears, and even some little neatly aligned rows of eyeballs which have been wrenched from their sockets. The victims uh, are shown contorted with pain, uh, their faces frozen in expressions of, of great anguish. Sometimes their lips are pulled back from their teeth and blood is frequently pouring from their mouth, nose, and eyes. And amidst all this horrible carnage, you have those marching figures striding by with sort of fixed expressions of determination and purpose. Considering the sheer amount of effort that went into creating this public display of violence, it must have been intended as an important statement that the builders of Cerro Sachin wanted to make. And scholars are somewhat divided over whether these reliefs should be read as an actual record of a historical conquest or maybe a representation of a mythological battle. But plainly, the marching figures are the victors and the corpses the losers. And it serves as a kind of frighteningly effective assertion of the power and the brutality of the dominant group. By the way, there have been some uh, attempts to explain away this monument as something more positive by certain scholars who just didn't want to believe that these early Andean cultures could have been so cruel and so savage. And one of these suggestions was that the whole thing was built as a sort of three-dimensional illustrated medical textbook where ancient doctors could come to learn about human anatomy. Well, very few people take that uh, rather wishful interpretation seriously. Graphic carvings such as those are actually somewhat common in South American and Mesoamerican cultures. The Mayans, uh, as well as others, frequently carved into stone images of racks composed of hundreds of human skulls. There's another site in Mexico called Monte Alban that uh, is contemporary, contemporary with Teotihuacano culture. And it also has a carved wall showing scores of mutilated human corpses. And the excavators at Monte Alban originally called those figures dancers because of the way that the bodies were contorted. And only later did they realize that those postures were due to the fact that they were meant to be in agony uh, rather than engaged in pleasant dances. If we look at China, the actions and accomplishments of Emperor Shi Wang Di uh, that we've looked at so far in this course would already have been more than enough to earn him uh, an important place in history. But we have yet to look at the single thing for which he's most well known today. And that's the spectacular tomb complex that he had built to hold his body after death. And it includes the famous terracotta warriors as well as one of the most impressive and really mysterious tombs of any ruler throughout all of history. Shi Wangdi started building his tomb almost as soon as he took the throne. And supposedly he employed 700,000 workers on it. And that number is almost certainly an exaggeration, but still, the scale of the effort was, was obviously massive. The actual burial chamber was hidden beneath a giant earthen mound 
over 200 feet in height, and its base forms a square that's almost 1,000 feet on each side. The tomb lay a further 100 feet below the original ground level. And the Chinese historian Sima Qian records what was placed within that tomb. In the tomb could be found palaces, scenic towers, and the hundred officials, as well as rare utensils and wonderful objects were brought to fill up the tomb. Mercury was used to fashion the hundred rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, and the seas in such a way that they flowed. Above were set the heavenly bodies, and below the features of the earth. So the ruler of the world was buried within a tomb that was itself a fantastic little model of the entire world, including the heavens and the earth. And maybe the most incredible aspect of all this is that map of China which is described, which has bodies of water represented by flowing streams of mercury. Now, Shi Wangdi's tomb has not actually been excavated. And for a long time, people were doubtful about the uh, veracity of that account, especially concerning that map with the mercury streams. But in the 1980s, geophysical surveys of the tomb mound were undertaken, which, among lots of other information they revealed, showed that the amount of mercury vapor rising from the soil. And it was discovered that an approximately 1,200 square foot section right at the center of the tomb had mercury levels that were between 3 and 50 times the natural soil levels for the region. And so that evidence very strongly suggests that the description of the mercury map and presumably all the other tomb features should be taken quite literally. That same study showed the existence of a tomb chamber that was 240 feet long, 150 feet wide, and 50 feet high. And maybe one day that mound will be excavated. And if so, uh, it could easily prove to be the most fantastic such find since the discovery of King Tut's tomb. As for the terracotta warriors, those were found in a series of pits about a mile eastward of the emperor's burial mound, and those have been at least partially uncovered. Farmers had been finding various buried uh, artifacts in that area for centuries. But the modern discovery and really awareness of the tomb and the warriors began on March 29, 1974. And on that day, the six Yang brothers were digging a new well for their family farm. And they began to pull life-size clay heads and body parts from the well shaft. And eventually, this would lead to the discovery of all the terracotta warriors. And in the end, 600 pits would be discovered in the vicinity of the emperor's tomb. Some of those have just a handful of objects, but others have thousands of them. And the terracotta warriors themselves are concentrated in four main pits. Pit number one is the largest, and it measures 700 feet by 180 feet. And it has mostly foot soldiers. Pit number two has a mixture of cavalry, chariots, and some foot soldiers. And pit number three has a single chariot as well as 68 high-ranking officers. And the interpretation is that that's the headquarters unit of this clay army. In all the pits, the floors are paved with bricks. And the roof is held up by packed earth walls which separate each row of soldiers. The soldiers themselves are arranged just as if they were a real army drawn up for review by their general. So the individual warriors stand uh, usually at attention, facing eastward. They're organized in ranks, uh, and they're categorized by the type of weapon that they carry. And the clay soldiers were equipped with fully functional bronze and wooden weapons. So they have perfectly usable uh, swords, crossbows, spears, uh, and halberds. And even the arrows are tipped with real bronze arrowheads. And this find, this archaeological site, is one of our best guides to understanding the arms and armor used in China during this period. 
The warriors are roughly life-sized, although maybe a little bit larger. The terracotta warriors symbolically express the status of the person depicted by variations in height. So for example, uh, regular soldiers average about 5 foot 10, but officers average about 6 foot 3, and the generals, the clay generals, average an impressive 6 foot 6. Within each class, there are also little minor variations which give individuality to the clay soldiers. And about 1,500 figures have been unearthed so far, but it's estimated that, taken all together, there would maybe be about 7,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and maybe 150 uh, cavalry horses. The warriors are built using multiple parts that are molded and cast separately, and then they can be combined. And they're built up uh, from the foot up to the head. There seem to be at least eight basic face designs, and six main types of body armor. And so you could mix and match these components to produce a lot of diversity. Specific details such as hairstyles and equipment were sometimes done individually, and that adds even more uh, variety to the whole thing. The level of detail and the craftsmanship which was lavished on these warriors is amazing. For example, even the patterns on the soles of the shoes of the soldiers is carefully sculpted. It's been estimated that about 1,000 skilled potters had to work for 12 years in teams of about 10 or 12 to create this army. And so complex are the individual figures that each team could only have completed maybe seven per year. Like ancient Greek sculpture, the terracotta warriors were originally brightly painted in hues of red, blue, green, and purple. So even though we're used to visualizing them in their sort of familiar tan hues, we need to mentally restore the paint in order to get a sense of their intended appearance. <clears throat> Scholars are still debating the purpose of the terracotta army. Whether this was supposed to somehow serve the emperor in the next life, or just to express his authority and add to the magnificence of his tomb is unknown. Certainly, this was not the only grandiose statement of power which Shi Wangdi indulged in. In his capital city, he symbolically asserted his domination over all the states he had conquered by constructing copies of his foes' palaces, all clustered together in one place in his own palace. And he filled these halls, walkways, and pavilions with heaps of precious objects looted from the original owners. And then as a sort of crowning touch, he inhabited this fantastic landscape with harems of beautiful women, uh, presumably also drawn from those regions he had enslaved. And so the emperor could walk complacently through this bizarre landscape composed of a, a hodgepodge assemblage of subjugated structures, objects, and people, and basically just marvel at the extent of his own power. Finally, we come to the Romans. Not only did they too build monuments celebrating their power, but one useful way of interpreting the entire city of Rome is as an enormous trophy case that no matter where you look, constantly reminded the viewer of Rome's total domination over the Mediterranean and its peoples. To begin with, the Romans were very fond of erecting large public monuments to commemorate military conquests. And probably the best known example of this were the triumphal arches which were put up by victorious generals or emperors. And these seem to have had their origins in more temporary arches that were placed uh, over archways and walls through which generals would come uh, when they celebrated a triumph. But the earliest true uh, freestanding triumphal arches um, were then placed along the path that those old triumphal processions had followed. Over time, the arch became a standard form of monument, and so they started to pop up in other places all throughout the city. And 
all of these arches would have been surmounted by a bronze statue group of a four-horse chariot uh, being driven by whoever was being honored. And these arches either had one big opening or else uh, triple passages, but the central one would have been larger than the ones on either side. And in addition to portraits of the person being honored, the arches were usually decorated with carved stone reliefs depicting scenes from the campaign. And most typically, these would show Roman soldiers slaughtering barbarians and then carrying booty back to Rome. There are archaeological remains or literary references to nearly 50 triumphal or commemorative arches that were built in the city of ancient Rome. But today, only three out of those 50 survive. One of the surviving arches, that of the Emperor Titus, was built in 81 AD to celebrate his military victories in Judea, uh, including his suppression of the rebellion of the Jews and the capture of the city of Jerusalem. And if you visit the Roman Forum today, you can walk under this arch, and you can gaze up at several famous panels that show Roman soldiers carrying away the loot that they had seized in the great temple of the Jews in Jerusalem. And if you look carefully, you can even see one scene where the soldiers are carrying a huge menorah, the uh, traditional seven-branch Jewish candlestick holder. Another common Roman form of victory monument was to put up a column topped by a statue of the general who had directed the conquest. And by the time of the late Republic, there is a veritable forest of honorific statues and columns scattered throughout Rome. A lot of them, though, clustering in and around the Roman Forum. By far the most spectacular form that this sort of column took, though, were those put up by the emperors Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, and both of those columns are still standing today. These were erected to celebrate military campaigns, and the entire shaft of each column was carved with a spiraling frieze that illustrated the course of those campaigns from beginning to end. And these continuous friezes, which tell that story in visual form, can really be read almost like a, a cartoon. <coughs> the Column of Trajan was dedicated on May 18th, 113 AD. And it commemorates a series of military campaigns waged by the emperor uh, in Dacia between 101 and 106. The shaft of this column is about 100 feet tall and 11 feet wide at the base, and it tapers slightly as it goes upwards. The shaft is composed of 17 separate drums of fine Luna marble, and the carved frieze uh, has 155 different scenes with over 2,600 figures. And if you were to take that frieze and manage to unravel it and stretch it out, it would be over 600 feet long. Now, it's meant to be read from the bottom upwards, and the figures increase slightly in size as they go up from the bottom. And the interpretation here is that this gives the illusion that when you look at it from below, they're all roughly the same scale. The Emperor Trajan often appears in these scenes, and he's usually shown in charge directing the campaign. And he's always carved just a little bit larger than everybody else to emphasize his status as emperor. And I like to tell my students that you can read this frieze as a graphic novel that tells the story of the campaign and shows every stage of a typical Roman military campaign, beginning with the generals planning their strategy, then it shows the troops marching out, uh, it has them camping in the field, fighting the enemy, and finally, of course, you see the soldiers marching back home, laden with all the uh, captured treasure and leading the enslaved barbarians. It's also a surprisingly uh, honest and accurate portrayal of the harsh realities of conquest. For example, there are scenes that show the Romans burning down native villages. Uh, rounding up women and children to be sold into slavery, displaying the heads of slain barbarian leaders on poles mounted outside the Roman camp, 
And there are lots and lots of scenes of Roman legionaries methodically chopping down wave after wave of barbarians. Now, it also shows more mundane activities. There's an awful lot of scene of uh, legionaries chopping firewood as well, or building bridges. But the overall impression is to emphasize the irresistible and terrifying military might of Rome. The column, by the way, served not just as a victory monument, but also as a mausoleum as well, because after Trajan's death, his ashes were put into a golden urn, which was placed within the base of the column. As time went on, the city of Rome itself more and more began to symbolize Rome's conquest of the Mediterranean world through its physical structures. Not only was the city crowded with triumphal arches, columns, and statues, uh, each of which was, in essence, a giant billboard uh, advertising victorious Romans and showing off vanquished enemies, but the public spaces of the city were decorated with items stolen from all over the Mediterranean during these campaigns. So many temples, such as uh, the great temples of Mars the Avenger, uh, the Forum of Augustus, the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus on the Capitoline Hill, were all stuffed to overflowing with enemy flags, uh, standards, armor, and other military trophies. And just the streets, the gardens, the baths, even the houses of individual Romans were decorated with works of art seized during Rome's conquests, uh, especially in the Greek East. The very stones that made up the great public buildings of Rome themselves could be seen as highly visible reminders of Rome's status as conqueror of the world. Because from every corner of the Mediterranean, the provinces were plundered in order to bring colored marbles and decorative stones to Rome to build these fantastic buildings. Some of the main uh, sorts of stones that were imported included things like fine white Greek marble from Mount Pentelicon near Athens, uh, and also from uh, the island of Paros in the Aegean Sea. Green Cipollino came from the island of Caristos, and a kind of a yellow and purple vein stone was brought in from the Dokimian quarries in Asia Minor. Egypt could contribute purple and green porphyry, which was hauled across the desert, and also a, a gray granite, which was mined in, uh, from an area called Mons Claudianus in Egypt. And so the very buildings that made up the city were themselves literally composed of booty taken from the conquered territories. And anybody walking around the city of Rome would have been confronted at every turn with reminders of Rome's total authority over the Mediterranean. And finally, of course, even many of the human beings living in this city were themselves a form of tribute attesting to Rome's dominance. Because in the wake of Rome's armies were always slave traders. And so hundreds of thousands of foreigners would find themselves shipped off to Rome as slaves, where they had to serve the whims of their Roman masters. And in the streets of Rome, all of their different languages, accents, costumes, and appearances would also have served as reminders of Rome's power and its authority. This impulse to assert one's power through symbolic statements in art and architecture is certainly not limited to the ancient world. Because so many of these monuments were uh, made out of relatively imperishable materials, such as stone, they are one of our best guides to how some rulers and peoples of antiquity wish to see themselves, and maybe more importantly, to be viewed by others. Thank you.